The Fundamentals of Nutrition is a session that, as I said, is going to bring you all up to the same platform. It's going to dispel the myths and have a look at the basic principles that sit behind the food that we eat. But to start it, I'm going to ask you some questions. But by the end of the session, you should be able to outline the benefits of good nutrition and food. You should be able to state which nutrients are essential to life and be able to classify vitamins and minerals. We're going to talk a little bit about vitamins and minerals, but at this level, vitamins and minerals wouldn't be something that you would be involved in uh, recommending to people. Uh, so we're only going to really look at them and what they are and what they do, because actually, if, if somebody comes to you and they have a specific problem, then that needs a higher level of, of dietitian to work with them. Uh, and the thing about vitamins and minerals, it's not just a, about whether somebody's having them or not having them, it's whether they're absorbed or not absorbed, and therefore it involves a, an amount of laboratory testing as well on absorption for people. So, So there are some simple nutrition truths, and I want to explore one with you. Really, the reason that we eat is very simple. That all our body cells require nutrients to live. So I want you to just think about that concept and think, well, what's a nutrient? And what is it about our cells that they require nutrients to live? So what, what's your thought process on that? Anybody want to share their thoughts? We need energy. So that's one of the uh, values that a, a cell needs. For any cell in the body to do its mechanical job, it must convert a chemical energy to mechanical work. The same as anything else would. A car, in order for it to do mechanical work, has to convert a, a, an energy source of some nature to do its job. And your body's no different. So when you look at the body, we have big users of that uh, chemical energy. We have muscle cells. We have nerve cells, uh, which referred to as neurons. We have brain cells. We have digestive system cells. We have cells circulating in the blood. Your body is one massive cellular structure. So in terms of um, making sure that it gets the nutrients it, it needs, energy is a big part of that. Why else might cells need nutrients? So we can function, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about function. What do we do? What do we mean by functioning? Mm -hmm. Repair. Yeah. Excellent. Reproducing cells, feeding themselves, keeping their processes going. Yeah, cells are like little factories aren't they they've got all this going on inside them so growth and, and repair and, and the cellular process itself we refer to the condition of a cell as homeostasis so when something is running well um, homeostasis is is there so if you think about that word home everything at home is supposed to be comfortable and normal and settled, and that's exactly what a cellular structure is like. It has a homeostasis point. So if a cell's homeostasis gets disrupted, that's when you start to have problems. So really, nutrients cover two areas for, for me, energy and a homeostasis process uh, recovery, growth and repair. So I want to explore the word nutrient with you because a nutrient itself can also be quite problematic. The definition of a nutrient is that it must give the body a beneficial effect. A nutrient must give a, the body a beneficial effect. Now, the emphasis should be on a wide selection of nutrients that include carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and water. When I look at a nutrient, if I said to you today, I'm going to take you out to lunch, I mean, that would be a miracle because I'm Scottish and I'm way too tight to do that. 
But if I said, I'm going to take you out to lunch. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm way too tight to take you out to lunch. Um, yeah. Uh, the further north you go, yeah, we're far too astute for that. Um, and I'm going to give you the choice between a McDonald's burger and chips, or I'm going to take you to the local Italian and we're going to have spaghetti bolognese. Now, don't put your uh, diagnostic heads on for a minute, but out of those two, which would you assume that normal people go, actually, the healthier option of those is, Italian. yeah, the Italian one. People would assume, would they not? And we're kind of lulled into that sense of security, aren't we? That we kind of, you know, McDonald's has had a real slating. You, you know, we all know since the Super Size series and everything that, oh, no, we don't want to touch McDonald's. But actually, in terms of nutrient content, they are both likely to be the same. So I just want to, to go through that with you and, and, and explore it a little bit, because the problem is that people assume the Italian is healthy and therefore they're likely to eat more of it. Whereas if you do go to McDonald's these days, you tend to think, oh, it's a bit of a treat and you'll have a small one. And I think in the UK they've stopped supersizing as well. So it's not allowed anymore in the UK. Um, so, you, you know, but people go spaghetti bolognese pasta i can have a load of that and i've heard fitness instructors say oh pasta it's got a tomato sauce on it and it's not a fat-based sauce and actually that's also not true so i want to ex explore this idea of nutrients so if i look at a mcdonald's it's a beef burger made with mince cooked on a griddle put in a white bun with skinny fries these days cooked in sunflower oil thank goodness my mother and her lard pan uh is no longer seen very much around the the country but um if you look at that, you've got a protein, you've got some carb and you've got some good oil in, in one way. If it's cooked in sunflower oil, it's not too uh, detrimental for the system. So then we go to the bowl of pasta. You've got it, uh, a spaghetti bolognese out. It's likely to be made with beef mince, uh, not cooked at home like you would cook, where the whole fat's drained off it and then you chop vegetables through it and then you put goodness in it and you do all of that it's anything mass cooked on mass is likely to be less um involved in good things going in and more involved in the cheaper end of things and how do we produce it cheaply and so on and so forth pasta is white it's a white carb it's overcooked it's it's treated by the body like sugar and therefore you're eating quite a large amount of it so when you look at both of those, to me, they're almost identical in nutrient content because the beneficial effect that they bring to the body is merely uh, energy. And they actually don't bring any vitamins, minerals or any nutrient content uh, work for homeostasis of the cell. So for me, I kind of split nutrients into two things. Do, are they empty calories, which are the ones that bring energy? and not a lot else? Or are they full of nutrients which bring good value to the cellular structure for homeostasis? So when you think about that, I can instantly kind of get to where some of the problem lies in the food industry. Because if I said to you, and, and I'm very much a creature of habit, I am, uh, as I say, I was born in Scotland and brought up up north. So Monday for us, was always sausage and mash night. Tuesday was always um, something different. Friday was always fish and chips because my dad got paid and my mum went to the supermarket and therefore she didn't do any cooking. She did the weekly shop at home. And that was how we lived. We always went to my grandma's on a Wednesday and, and she made mince and mash. And, and, and that was how we lived. And we kind of live a little bit like that now. If you have a breakfast cereal, you tend to buy the same breakfast cereal and eat it for a number of days altogether if you go to the indian restaurant you always have the same indian meal or, or or the indian takeaway you pick the same or the chinese takeaway you pick the same meal you have your favorites so what's missing is this selection across a wide nutrient content no longer can you tell in the shops what's in season and what's not I mean, it's been asparagus season for a couple of months. The only time that you can tell it is, is asparagus comes slightly down in price. But you can get it in the shops all the time. Christmas used to be so exciting for me because satsumas came out. 
now you can get Zoomers all the time. Where's the excitement in that? They should only come at Christmas. So, so the, the benefit of, of nutrients across different foods and across different things within season has kind of all gone uh, in one way good, because that means you can get access to all these foods all the time. <coughs> but you've got to question how you can have a Zatzuma in middle of uh, June and July in the UK when uh you, you know or the middle of winter and so on and so forth so so they're imported they're preserved how much vitamin content do they have anymore all of those things start to to come into question so i want you to think about those principles as we go through the next day so when i look at food the the, the term that i put around that is quality so what is the quality of the nutrient content of this food so if I was to look at carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals and water, say so what is the quality of it and where has it come from? And I do think the food industry have a lot to explain about it. Have you, anybody been watching this, the series Food Uncovered? You should watch it. It's amazing. I think they do a really good job because uh, it's called Food Uncovered. It's on television at the moment. And you can get it on back on iPlayer. But it's a, a young couple and they go around exploring different foods. Um, and they really kind of go in quite de deep about it. And they go and visit the manufacturer, the growers. They go and visit all these places and try and find out how the food. But what cracks me up is they always start off with a phone call to the manufacturer and go, I'm interested in this food and what the content of it is. Has it got any of this in it? And the, the manufacturers always go, Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Their first line is always they don't know. Uh, and, and then they have to explore much deeper and go into it. And, and I think we need to do a little bit more of that. We need to be much more astute shoppers and uh, much more astute buyers of food. And the question that you need to ask yourself is what is the quality of the food uh, that you're buying? And the quality for me means does it bring the nutrient content for homeostasis as well as the empty calories? If it's not, we refer to it as empty calories and it brings nothing else. Does that make sense? So um, if we look at that, I, I want to recap first energy systems. Because in order to understand the energy side, you need to be very, very familiar with energy systems. So I'm now going to be your worst nightmare for about 15 minutes and take you back to uh, your fitness instructor courses in the beginning and get you to recall the energy system cycle for me. So firstly, I'll go back to my line earlier, which is all cells require a chemical energy to convert to mechanical work, muscle cell. What does a muscle cell do? Contract. Yeah, contracts to move, to sit you upright. I mean, at the moment now, some of your muscles aren't contracting at all because you're leaning back in your chairs. All of you sit on the end of your chairs upright without using the back of your chair. Now, if you sat like that for the rest of the day, your muscles would burn much more energy than they've been burning because actually, you, you know, you've, kind of siphon down how much your muscles use just by they're designed to work if you literally sit upright like this all day your back muscles your ab muscles your shoulder girdle muscles your pelvic muscles your glutes everything would start to fire and work to keep you upright think of the calorie output of that i mean to a point it's not about exercise um because if the that i work with choose four things in your life that you could do every single day, not exercise based, that would increase your turnover of energy in your body. And one could be as simple as I'm going to sit on the edge of my chair or at my desk. I'm not going to sit back on my desk. I'm going to stand for 30 minutes at my desk. You can even buy stand desks now, can't you? Some offices have got stand desks. Or when I'm on a phone call and I'm not at my computer, I'm going to get up and I'm going to pace around my desk. You know, you can choose things that just literally take the calorie value up of, of what we do so i want you to, to think about that in your understanding of the energy system so muscle is one of the biggest users of the chemical energy in the body 
the nervous system. It sends signals to muscle to contract. It's, it's got thought processes. That's also a big user. The third big user, which is, uses about 10% of, of the energy value of a day, is the digestive system itself. So by eating food, you burn more calories because to actually digest it, that's a process. And that process is mechanical work that needs a chemical energy. Make sense? So actually, we get vision if you understand the energy systems, which is the energy going in should equal the energy going out. And therefore, you would be in neutral energy balance and your weight would stay the same. If you go into what we call positive energy balance, that means calories have gone in, then your body is expending in its need throughout the day, in its turnover of chemical energy. You're in positive energy balance, therefore it stores it and your weight will go up. If you want to lose weight, it becomes a simple equation of a negative energy balance. So if you reduce going into your body by what your output is, then your body will seek that extra fuel from storage and therefore create its chemical energy from your stored energy rather than uh, having to eat it all the time. It's a very simple equation for sports people, but almost a nightmare, particularly when you look at somebody like an Ironman. You, you, know, you were talking, Stuart, about feeding an Ironman. Well, an Ironman on a training day can need 6,000 calories. Eating 6,000 calories means they may as well just lie on the floor and continually eat because to get that in in a day is huge. But if you take me or my mother, who's maybe a desk worker, who's working in an office all day, uh, my calorie need is right down on that. And it's therefore very easy for me to overeat in fuel. And therefore that fuel goes to storage. Make sense? So, so it is in one hand, a simple equation. If it was that simple though, we'd be able to solve it. And, and, and don't get me wrong, it's not that simple, but it is the major. And uh, I always, and it's not a very nice analogy, but I always remember my doctor uh, once saying, uh, when I was very young and we were having a dis discussion around it, uh, if I put you in Belson, do you think you would still be overweight? So when people say, no, but there's all sorts of other reasons, you in Belson, would you be overweight? And the simple answer to that is no. I don't think anybody came out of their overweight. So, so you do get back to that, but and it's not a very nice analogy, and I don't want to offend anybody by that analogy, but it does make the point of if, if you were put into a situation where you didn't have the food, would you still have the same weight management issue? So big question. So let me take you back on energy systems, um, understand what we are actually talking about when we're talking about that positive energy balance and that uh, negative energy balance. So what is the chemical energy that your body requires to convert to mechanical work? Glucose is one of the elements that comes into it on how it makes it, but the actual chemical. It, uh, <coughs> So ATP. ATP. ATP, that very scary word that took me a long time. So adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine linked to three phosphates in a covalent bonded chain. Now we have about two seconds worth of ATP in every cell in the body. So if I said to you, stand up, sit down, gone. It's exploded, it combusts. Energy lives on the final bonding in the ATP cycle. For a simplistic way of looking at it, it lives on that final bond. What happens in that cell is ATP sits on the myosin head. So if you look at myosin head, acting a myosin contract, it combusts in a chemical process inside the cell and it releases the energy bond that sits uh, on the... Uh, final phosphate bond. You are there, then left with what they call ADP and an inorganic phosphate uh, that's floating. So ADP is di is two instead of three. So you have one molecule of adenosine 
methane and two phosphates um, now in the covalent bonding. So we need a way of recoupling the ATP in order to create the energy bond again, in order to release it and keep it going in a cycle. So it's as simple as that. It becomes ADP and then it has to become ATP and we go around in a cycle. Now, that's an interesting cycle because lots of times people refer to three energy systems, but actually there isn't three energy systems to a point. There's only one energy fuel that we use, and that's adenosine triphosphate. So we have to have ways of making this. So I want you to imagine the maker of man made us on a day off and he's off out to play golf. And he says to his wife, I'm off out to play golf. And she said, well, look, you've made these humans and all you've given them is two seconds of energy. So they got up to do the housework and now they're flat on the floor. So that's no good. You need to give them some kind of energy fuel because I need them to do some jobs and move about, which is exactly what we've got it for. So he goes, OK, then I will put inside every cell they've got another high energy compound. Therefore, they don't need anything else. So we have inside a cell creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine, doesn't matter which way around you say it, CP. And he put in about 10 to 20 seconds worth. It's what I call the Ritz fire lighter. If you want it and you threw some uh, barbecue lighter on it and it explodes and gives you that instant energy. That's what CP does. It doesn't need food. It doesn't need oxygen, therefore we class it as anaerobic. It, it can produce ATP, not in the present, so it is anaerobic. Like all things, you have, the more you train for something using the principle of overload, the more of it you have. So somebody who trains for CP could get about 20 seconds worth out. And I know lots of people in the fitness industry who load for it as well. They take creatine loading and things like that. We can discuss that later, but that's what they're trying to do, system and challenge it so that they get about 20 seconds worth out of it rather than at the lower end of its use. But regardless of anything, if I now got you up and moving and did 20 squ squats, 20 seconds in, that energy fuel is starting to uh, run out and it's looking for some in it. So what we do have in our system, we have it in sufficient quantities, is what Alison uh, said, which is glucose. So we eat carbohydrate. It's the easiest fuel for the body to break down. And we're going to have a full lecture on carbohydrate. It goes into the system really quickly. It breaks down into a single molecule, which is glucose or fructose. It passes through the small intestine into the bloodstream where your pancreas produces insulin and insulin picks it up, makes it into a starch called glycogen, carries it across the muscle membrane wall and stores it as an energy fuel and stores it for emergency fuels. And the liver is responsible for keeping the blood sugar steady and therefore the brain, because the brain can only function on this fuel. So we have glucose that can come into the system. Now, glucose can come into the chemical structure of ATP and it has a, a, a molecular content that can rebuild the phosphates. And it has a byproduct of pyruvate and hydrogen ions. So glucose can be used and it starts to regenerate ATP because you've eaten your carbs well and it's all there and everything's happening normally and it starts to regenerate ATP. But it gives off hydrogen ions and hydrogen ions can accumulate and form a lactate start salt, which then forms a lactic acid, which we then can't tolerate because it is an acid and it will destroy a cell. So we have to disassociate the buildup of hydrogen by ensuring that we get oxygen around there, which then carries away the byproducts to the liver where they reformed into glycogen and reused again. 
So as long as we get oxygen around there, we can use glucose in abundance. Now, that makes glucose operating two ways, anaerobically, and we refer to it as anaerobic glycolysis, the breaking down of glucose anaerobically, or aerobic, very clear which one you're talking about. But oxygen comes from out here. Only 21% of air is oxygen. When you breathe in and it circulates, you only use about, six to, uh, about 5% of it. 16% of it, about 15 to 16% of it is exhaled again. So that's why you have to breathe all the time and you have to be pumped around the system and you have to uh, keep supplying oxygen. So if we then put you into a movement or exercise situation, and let's have a look at these three energy systems, how they apply. Um, the biggest muscles on the body are where? The legs, the quads, the hamstrings, the glutes. So at the moment, your quads, hamstrings and glutes are just relaxing and therefore not turning over much ATP into that and only sending enough oxygen around there for the turnover ATP at the level at which it's turning. So you are working at the moment aerobically. Now, if I suddenly start to get you up and moving, those muscles start to contract. For them to contract, which is them, they need chemical energy. So the demand for ATP goes up. So initially, it will use CP, and then it will start to look for glucose to make the ATP. Now, we have lots of glucose stored in your muscles, so it's absolutely fine. It will use the local glucose. But if it uses it without oxygen, and continues to use it without enough oxygen because your heart rate was quite low and you suddenly started to, to jump about and do lots of things, um, you're in what we call oxygen debt in the muscle. And therefore, you are beginning to work anaerobically. Now, your brain will register the accumulation of the lactate salt into lactic acid. And it, we call it OBLA, the onset of blood lactate accumulation. So your brain's registering that and it can't allow it to go beyond a certain point because if it does sell because it's an acid. So basically what happens is your brain will raise your heart rate, raise your breathing rate, trying to get oxygen around there at the demand at which it, it's asking for traction. So if you're nice and fit, your heart will be able to deliver lots. But if you're not very fit, it's going to take some time. It's going to struggle to get it round there and therefore you're going to have to go much more gradually building up your uh, leg work. Make, make sense with that? So as long as glucose is present and we can get oxygen round there at the same rate at which ATP is being demanded by the muscles for the job to be done, you are then working aerobically and all is good. So you can then work aerobically as long as you have enough glucose present. Now, glucose comes from food, from the form of carbohydrate food. We eat and it gets broken down in the system and stored. And we store about a pound and a half when our stores are full. It's about 300 to 500 grams. Now, that's enough calories for 24 hours, enough fuel for about 24 hours. In an exercise situation of moderate to high intensity, that would only be enough for about 90 minutes. It's also stored wet, so it takes in to storage three times its weight in water. So if your carb stores are full, you will be heavier on the scales than when they're empty. I can instantly make you lose weight on the scales by just not allowing you to have carb for 24 hours. It won't have touched your fat stores. Now, in an exercise situation, it lasts about 90 minutes, so we do need, a no matter how much an athlete or a sports person will carb during uh, an event it's not going to be enough to uh to keep turning over the rate at which they are exercising so if you look at long endurance events like marathons uh multi marathons uh iron mans all those sorts of events they tend to need between about six grams of carb an hour for, for the turnover and that's to keep it minimum and nice and steady um, and that 
often because blood is diverted from the digestive system away to the working muscles, often it can't be stomached as heavy carbs. And that's when they might be taking drinks, gels, bananas, uh, any sort of form of carb that they can get in during that time. So carb becomes the, the, the vital thing. Now, assume that actually to work longer than that, and therefore we need a secondary fuel. So the first part of the cycle of ATP can be done anaerobically and can use glucose, but we can also carry on using glucose. The byproduct is pyruvate. Now, if we can get oxygen around there, Oxygen needs a cooker. Oxygen needs a cooker. It can't be uh, metabolized and go into the cycle unless it goes into the cooker. And the cookers that we have within the muscles are the mitochondria. And we'll have a look at the specific type of muscle because we have lots of mitochondria in type um, one muscle fiber, slow twitch muscle fiber but we also have them in type 2A, or the potential to have them in type 2A. Now, oxygen comes into the cooker, as does glucose. So we can now burn glucose aerobically. So we can burn it anaerobically in the power type fibres that we've got. We can burn it aerobically inside the fibres that have got uh, mitochondria in. And those are type 1 slow twitch fibers red because they have oxygen um, and the type 2a if we train them so they train they will behave in a way in which they train those fibers for moderate uh, intensity endurance uh, then they will you will increase the amount of muscle fiber you've got at rest to use fuel so it's a really good thing to target those fibers now assume that we're going to work more than 90 minutes or you, you need extra fuel throughout the day and use now that we're inside the mitochondria and we have oxygen is fat. So fat is the fuel that we can have inside the mitochondria that can be burnt in the energy systems the same way as carbohydrate can. No good for anaerobic work because it has to have oxygen. It also has to have its own oxygen content, so you need slightly more oxygen to burn it. Yeah. You also need to unlock fat. Enzymes are keys to processes. So an enzyme unlocks a process. The enzyme that unlocks fat, and you won't be tested on this, this is just more for your interest, is an enzyme called acetal coenzyme A. Acetal coenzyme A is made from pyruvate. Can you remember where pyruvate came from? It's a byproduct of yeah, with glucose. Yeah. So pyruvate is the byproduct of the breakdown into ATP of glucose. So you cannot make the enzyme that unlocks fat if glucose is so you cannot run out of glucose contrary to popular opinion you, you, you know so you cannot eliminate glucose from the diet a marathon runner whose glucose is running out would be hitting the wall if it runs out in the liver they're in a much more serious situation they've now bonked what we would call bonking and the body will go into a panic and trauma and uh, it will try to shut down all the processes that use energy because it, it, it has no other alternative because there is insufficient fuel for the brain. So you uh, can cause the body a traumatic problem if you don't uh, have it. And you'll have seen, and it's only for me, elite sportsmen could do it. You might have seen them in the Olympics where they've worked so hard or, and they're coming over the line and their legs are wobbling and their bodies are going all over the place and they can't speak. Did mm -hmm. anybody saw the guy on um, Tour de France yesterday? He was third up to yesterday. Did anybody see him going up the mountain? Uh, it was really interesting. Do the replay if you, if you can on yesterday.
Ice, which had, I think, 17 yesterday. But he was going up the mountain. He, he's been third all the way through. And everybody just romped past him. And, and you could see he was out of it. He couldn't speak. He was barely cycling. Uh, you know, his legs were ba barely turning over. And, and he was clearly just like way out of it, it you, you know, so he was quite ill, um, you, you know, because his body is just struggling the whole way. And, and that's what happens. So you can't work without carbohydrates being present. Now, fat can come into the equation, but when we start to burn fat as a fuel, um, as long as glucose is present, we're fine. And when you're exercising over a long time, you should burn both. And at rest, you should burn both. So uh, at rest, it's, it's crucial to um, burn both. Now, if carbohydrate starts to run out, we can make glucose from somewhere else. Now, we can make glucose from protein. But we don't store protein. So protein can make pyruvate uh, so we can make pyruvate from our protein stores which is muscle so we can cannibalize our lean tissue to create pyruvate uh, just its simplicity it's, it's different chemicals but it'll bring the chemicals in to create we can carry on burning fat as a fuel but if we do we get an incomplete breakdown of fat and an incomplete breakdown of fat gives us something called ketones. Ketones, which smell like pear drops on the breath. Ketones. Now, the brain can function on ketones, but you'll feel quite unwell. You're in what we call a ketogenic state. So you're burning protein. To, to make the enzymes that unlock the fat in order to burn fat as fuel. That would happen on a big ultra event. You, you know, you, you know, when uh, they went to the North Pole and they walked to the North Pole, they'll come back. No matter how much food they try to eat, they'll come back huge amounts lighter because their muscle tissue will all be degraded as they do it. So we can go into this ketogenic state, but it's not a healthy state to be in. Now, many uh, nutrition lecturers will tell you you can live in that state. For me, there is no epidemiological evidence. So have a look at what I mean by epidemiological. Epidemiological evidence is the study of disease, and it is peer assessed study that has been scientifically tested. So because of the open access you have on the internet, you have to be careful what you read. What you should be reading is peer assessed journals. Uh, um, so it could be something like the Lancet or the uh, Journal of the Journal of Nutrition, where any articles that are published have been to a review board where the methodology behind what they're saying has been tested and therefore it's published. So uh, uh, so be really careful what you read. Now, where I mean epidemiological evidence, let's take a type one diabetic. A type 1 diabetic cannot produce insulin. Their pancreas cells have been destroyed and they do not produce insulin. So if they can't produce insulin, they have to take insulin by injection or by a pump or by patches or by pills. There's lots of different ways of taking it now, but they have to take insulin. Now, insulin over a long period of life, taking it like that, and the high sugar volumes that come with it, cause the body a number of condition problems. They can cause a retinopathy to the eye, where the high sugar levels destroy the nerves to the eye. They cause a retinopathy called a neuropathy in the foot, where it destroys the nerves to the foot. And uh, they also then can start to struggle with their weight as well because insulin is an influencer on fat go up. Uh, they also can get ulcerated sores because healing is problematic from sugar. So insulin, uh, type 1 diabetics are usually diagnosed quite young. It's usually an uh, immune uh, deficiency. It's not related to weight management. It's when the white blood cells have attacked the pancreas and killed the cells that produce uh, insulin. Now, 
if it was easy to live without carb, a doctor could go, actually, stop eating carb because you can no longer eat it. Yeah, just stop eating that food. What would happen to a diabetic who didn't eat carb is their blood sugar would crash and they would go into a coma and they would die. So there is no epidemiological evidence anywhere that says you can live without carb. So lots of people will tell you you can live in a ketogenic state, but it is not a healthy homeostatic state to put the body in. So carb is a crucial part of the diet, as well as protein and as well as fat. So this is where these three fuels, referred to as macronutrients, nutrients we need in large amounts, are crucial to the body. And we'll have a look at the balance and things of those as we go. And remember, we've got an lecture on each of these in their own right. Now, I just want to introduce a couple of other terms to you uh, that will help you understand some of the stuff as we go through the two days. So firstly, the word metabolism is bandied about quite a lot. What metabolism actually means is the ATP cycle. This is metabolism. Sometimes referred to as cellular respiration because the cell is breathing and metabolism. I often hear people say, well, he's got a fast metabolic rate and she's got a slow metabolic rate or vice versa. I want you to get rid of the term rate in your head because everybody's rate is the same at rest per kilogram of muscle. Per kilogram of muscle at rest, it metabolizes 3.5 mil of oxygen per kilogram of muscle in the energy cycle at rest thus. It's referred to as one met. Have you heard of mets? So one metabolic equivalent, a met, is what a kilogram of muscle turns over at rest. I prefer to think of people, rather than somebody as having a fast rate or a slow rate, I prefer to think of people as a high user of metabolism or a low user. So it's not fast or slow, it's high or low for me. Somebody is a high user because they have a very lean muscular body, they have a very highly efficient nervous system, and therefore turning over ATP at rest is high for them. The more muscle tissue, more type A, particularly muscle tissue somebody has, um, uh, type 2A and type 1, the more they'll turn over at rest. There's, can you see the analogy in that? So that's why people have different rates as such and can use different calories because they have different things going on in their bodies and different usage of, of metabolism. Now, um, the other term I want to get you familiar with is the term calories. Calories is a kilocalorie in our language, but I just dropped the K. So whenever I refer to a calorie, I actually mean a kilocalorie. A kilocalorie is a measure of the metabolic respiration in a cell. That's what it's measuring. So it's a measure of metabolism. When you're working aerobically, the byproducts that you give off are heat, water, and CO2 when you're working aerobically. CO2 you breathe out, water goes back into the lymph system or goes to the surface of the skin where it's sweated out, and that helps disperse heat, which is taken to the surface of the skin and you, you uh, sweat it or it evaporates. Now, the heat that's given off in this is measured and enough heat to raise one gram of water, one degree centigrade is a calorie. Okay, you won't be tested on that. It, enough, I just want to show you why we can talk about calories. Enough heat to raise one gram of water, one degree centigrade is a calorie. So what we then do with food is a scientist called Atwater invented a bomb calorimeter, 
which is an oxygen chamber in which food is combusted in a similar way it is in a cell. So you'll get them in universities and labs and food labs and it's combusted and the heat given off is measured. And the heat given off particular foods is then given a calorie value. So the calorie values of uh, fat is nine calories per gram. Carbohydrate is four. Protein is four. And uh, alcohol is seven. So you can't get away with the alcohol either. It has a calorie value. We will be looking at that. So when I get when I start to talk about the energy side of the nutrient, has that helped to understand what we're talking about? We're talking about this side of what those nutrients bring to the table. So if they're poor quality, they bring this and nothing else. You also want your cells to be healthy, lots of them, growth and repair taking place, homeostasis is taking place. If you can eat these from a good quality source that bring along with vitamins, minerals, and all the repairing processes then you've got a double win haven't you if you just eat empty calories all the time your body will degrade homeostasis will go out things won't work as well as they should do and therefore you'll get all sorts of other problems coming into the equation so what we need is food to go back to its absolute simplest form and you mentioned this morning Emma eating clean because actually the cleaner you eat and the better quality your resource then the more likely you are that everything will work normally so we've solved it haven't we we can all go home now mm -hmm. we've solved it so just recap that then uh, as we go through the slides because i know you've got the notes uh, as well uh, but let's just recap it to decide on how much we should eat of those food groups there are something called the dietary reference values now referred to as the RDAs, um, the required daily amounts. Now, again, I don't want you to get into the required daily amounts. I want you to just think about those calories. And what we're going to do is be able to work out how many calories somebody needs. Vitamins and minerals, as I said, you shouldn't really be looking at the RDA of that because um, it's too specialist. But to say that, there is absolutely no harm recommending to somebody a multivitamin and mineral tablet. You will never go over the RDAs. Where you go over the recommended daily allowances is if you start to do specific vitamins, and we'll have a look at that separately. So here is a very complicated picture of what we just spoke about. Metabolism. Go back one. Sorry, guys. So, so here you see we have glucose in the form of glycogen coming into the energy cycle where it gives off pyruvate, which makes pyruvic acid, which can form lactic acid with the hydrogen ions, yeah, going off there. But you can see that acetyl coenzyme A is the enzyme made to burn fat in the second part of the cycle, which is the aerobic part of the cycle, often referred to as the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, all talking about the same thing. Now, you can also see that amino acids make pyruvic acid. But then fat would not break down completely and they would give off ketone bodies. So this is a complex diagram that shows the chemical reaction of everything that we've just spoken about. But this is metabolism. To be fair, you don't need to understand the diagram. You just need to understand what energy is and why the body uses it. Because then you can really, really help people uh, understand what their body needs are. So in feeding metabolism, 
we first have carbohydrate. And the function and the main function of carbohydrate is to give off energy, which will also give off the byproduct of heat, and therefore we can measure it in calories. It's interesting that, uh, and we'll have a look at fat in a second, but often when I say to people, uh, you, you know, what do you think fat's used for in the body? They often say uh, to me, uh, oh, it's used to keep you warm. But actually, somebody who has got more muscle and is metabolic is like a little furnace quite often. They, they're always warm um, because they're always turning over energy. Fat, for me, isn't a substance that keeps you warm to a point. Um, it, you, you know, if you look at a polar bear, it's not its fat that keeps it warm, it's its fur. You, you, you know, so I think it's wrong to, to say that it's acceptable to have fat to keep you warm. Actually, you'd be better off with muscle to keep you warm. So the second one is protein, and that's used for growth and repair of cellular structure, but can also be used for energy. For a little bit, it should be over there somewhere in the package. Fats. Now, fats are great. I love fats in more ways than one. Firstly, fat um, uh, is very satiety based, you know, so when you have fat on a meal, it, it actually uh, can help with hunger and things like that. Also, it is not the enemy that you think it is. When you need somebody needs to cut down fat, well, then, yes, they need to cut it down. But you generally find they need to cut everything down. Fat you cannot live without. Fat can be used in the energy systems, but also it is a, a vital structure of all cell membranes. And it is a precursor for hormone increase. It's a precursor for hormone increase. Particularly when you look at the good fats. When you look at the good fats and the essential fats, you cannot make hormones in your body without them. And I'm going to have a whole lecture on those. So when we look at the fat lecture, we'll look at those hormones in general. Also, there's an element of fat used for making the myelin sheath in nerves. And that's responsible for um, nerve impulse to muscle and all your thought processes and, and neurologically working properly. So again, if you're not having the essential fats and you're not building your myelin sheaths properly, uh, then you can't function properly. So a lot of people who go on a low fat diet actually end up on a high sugar diet with insufficient fat and they become fat phobic and can't function properly metabolically because they've cut the fat out of the diet. So it's really interesting. When we come to analyze diets tomorrow, you'll, you'll spot it straight away now. And, and especially after we've had the fat lecture. And, and that's why I have a big, massive issue with the food industry advertising products that are 25%. I got myself into really deep water in one of my FitPro conference lectures where I said, there's one of the diet companies, and I won't name the diet company, but they use a marker for fat. And somebody in the audience asked me about the marker. They said, well, we're told if something has more than four grams of fat per 100 grams, it's a high fat food and you shouldn't be recommending it. And to be quite polite and um, professional about it, well, what about a, a good piece of oily salmon? It has um, a lot of fat in the body uh, of a, a piece of salmon and it's absolutely crucial for your diet. So, of course, it has more than four grams of fat per hundred and you can get a bit bonkers about it if you want people go oh you know milk to semi-skin does anybody know how many grams of fat full fat milk has in it four. yeah four and a half yeah it's not a high fat food so why would you take children off full fat milk and give them semi-skin unless they have a massively everything needs cutting back in fat and then you need to have a look at it so so really and that's where you get back to what I said at the beginning, you need to understand food. If you want to work with nutrition, you need to become a foodie. You need to have a love for finding out what food's about and trying things. And, you, you, you know, in the early days, I used to spend hours and hours in supermarkets looking at the back of packets and buying things I didn't really want because I wanted to try them and see what it was like. And, you know, there's no point saying to a client, 
I want to recommend, uh, so I'll take you in North Wood Craig. You get a client and you say, I want you to recommend that you change the type of carbohydrate you eat. There's no point making that recommendation if you can't tell them where they can buy it, how much it costs, which brands they should be buying, what they should change for what. And I get that quite a lot in the case studies that come back. Some of you will make recommendations. They'll go, you need uh, on your recommendations on the bit that you do on your case study, you'll put change the type of carb. I'll immediately send it back if that's all you put. Because I always want, with a case study, I want you to put yourself in the client's position and go, well, if, okay, if you're recommending I change carb, where, how, what, how much is it going to cost me? You, you know, a, a, a loaf of soya and linseed bread costs about one pound eighty. A loaf of uh, no frit cheat based breast costs about twenty p. I've got a family of five to feed. I'm on ninety pound a week. You know, can I pay one pound eighty for my bread? No. So you have to come up with different recommendations of how they can do things. Can you see what I'm saying? So you need to get your head around food, and you need to start to become a foodie. And fat's one of those particular things you need to get a a, a, a love for, and stop treating it like the enemy. You've got to look for it and make sure it puts back in. The other thing is a lot of people struggle with weight management because they've cut fat out. Because if you starve the body of something, it will not give up what you're asking it to, to give up of it, and it can't function without it. What, without fat? Yeah. No, it's still store uh, what you eat, but it'd grab it even more because, and, and the problem is, and when we do the carbohydrate lecture, I'll tell you, because calories only come from three places, and if you lower the fat down beyond normal, it means the sugar's gone up. And, and if the sugar goes up, you've got a bigger problem than fat. In fact, there's a closer link to obesity being around when low-fat diets came in than uh, anything else in the UK. So, you, you know, we, you do need to get balance and good quality food, and it's as simple as that. All these tasks you guys, they say, look, cut this, cut this, cut that. One that, that's recent now uh, is cut off by um, dairy. But as you go back to basics, dairy's always been around. Yeah. So why is people saying, nutrition saying, cut dairy out, where it's always been something, something new? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's the problem. Uh, you know, cutting dairy out is not the answer. It'll cut calories and people will lose weight. The problem with some dairy is that you can have a gut irritation as you get older because milk is a food designed for the young. Animals produce milk for them. So you can get a gut lining irritation to um, dairy. Yeah. But you would know you've got that. Yeah, no, yeah. And it would if be diagnosed. If you don't have a medical reason. If to cut it then you don't need to cut it it's a good source of food so so you do have to get yeah. back to realism but a lot of the diets cut something and they'll always work because effectively by cutting something you'll cut calories and if you cut calories um you will succeed in weight management but you won't succeed long-term diets these people will then put the weight back on when they start eating normally again and because metabolism starts to conserve itself because it's like, well, you're not going to give me what I need. I have to become more efficient at what I do. And then you get an adjustment to it. So, so it is as simple as that, really. Now, the other two uh, processes that we need are vitamins and minerals. Vitamins are organic substances, and they regulate the body's processes. And minerals are inorganic, and they give the body strength. So they give cellular structure strength. So they're things like rocks, salts, oils, whereas vitamins are organic. Uh, um, and they're found in fruit and green leafy veg and so on and so forth. So the difference really is in these two plates. If you look at the plate on the, the right, it's got healthy nutrient values in there. If you look on the plate on the left, it's empty calories. Can you see that? So here are the calorie values of the food adjusted by what we call the apt water factor. So kilojoules are the international measure and kilocalories are the UK measure. But it's a bit like everybody else works in centimetres and uh, metres and the English still work in inches and feet. 
the amount of people I get in for wellness tests downstairs who say to me, oh, I only know my weight in pounds and stones. Mm -hmm. They don't know their weight in kilos or, or anything like that. So this is the same. And there's 4.2 difference between the two. So the kilojoules are always the higher figure. So if you divided by 4.2, you'll get the kilocalories. If you divide by, uh, if you multiply by 4.2, you'll get kilojoules if you've got kilocalories. So it doesn't matter which way round it is, um, as long as you do that equation. Now, Atwater is the, the scientist who invented the bomb calorimeter for testing food and calories. And the reason I've shown you, and you don't have to remember the Atwater factor, the reason I've shown you the adjustment is because when we come to do the food groups, you'll get an understanding of why even the digestive system uses more energy to uh, burn protein. Protein is the hardest food for the body to break down. So therefore, it loses some of its energy in the breakdown process because some of its energy is given off at that point in time to the energy cycle. So therefore, because the actual real value of protein in a bomb calorimeter is about 5.7 calories. But in the body, it's about four calories because it's so hard for the body to break down. Whereas if you look at carbohydrate, it's the easiest food for the body to break down and the body breaks it down straight away. So again, this high sugar diet uh, is causing the body uh, problems. And we'll, I was going to save some of my surprises for the carbohydrate lecture. So this is what makes a healthy diet. On average, you should have, uh, th sorry, what does make a healthy diet? This is what a diet looks like in the UK at the moment. Uh, and particularly among sports people, about 40% of their calories coming from carb, about 40% of their calories coming from fat, of their calories coming from protein. Now, that's the average diet. What a healthy diet should look like is that 50% of the calories should come from carb. No more than 30% of the calories come from uh, fat and about 20% of the calories from protein. And remember, you've got these slides. Now, if you're looking at a sports person, you can play about with the calories a little bit more. About 60% of their calories should come from carb and about 25% from fat and 15% and from protein. Although for a sports person, I'm also, also in, lightly inclined to take their fat down to about 20% and their protein at about 20%. If you want a, a sports person to go on a high protein diet, I would go 40, 40, 20. So it'd be 40 carb, 40 protein and uh, 20 fat. So there's different ways of manipulating it for sport, depending on what people want to do. But the reason I've shown you that is a lot of people say to me, oh, a normal person's carbohydrate calories should come uh, between about 50 to 60 percent. But actually, a normal person doesn't need more than 50 percent of their calories from carb because there's not much of this going on. They just need enough to fuel this. So, and also fitness instructors mix up the message a little bit. You know, I hear fitness instructors say to normal people, um, oh, before you come to the gym, make sure that you have a banana or, or something. Actually, a normal person doesn't need it. There's only somebody who goes into depletion needs to top up. So if you take Mary, let's take normal Mary. She has for breakfast, what do, sort of things do people eat for breakfast? Cereals, Cereals toast. toast, fruit yogurt yeah maybe eggs on a day off but on a weekday they're likely to not be cooking that kind of thing but on a day off yeah a bit of egg but predominantly what food group is that carbohydrate uh for a snack what sort of things might people have for a snack when in the middle of the day sandwich fruit biscuits crisps what food group is that carbohydrate what sort of thing do people have for lunch sandwich Bread, rice, pasta, potato. What food group is that? Carbohydrates. What do they have for snack in the afternoon? Biscuits, cakes, chocolates, fruit. Even if they have it healthy and it's fruit and it's nuts. What food group is that? 
carbohydrates. Why do they need a banana before they come to the gym? It's not rocket science, is it, really, when you get down to it? Actually, in the gym, I want to cause depletion. So actually, for a normal person, I don't want you stocking up before you come to the gym. I want you to come to the gym and work some of it off. But for a sports person who is going to do some high-intensity training, different ball game. So what I find happens in weight management is a lot of the messages get mixed up in the fitness industry between sports nutrition messages and basic nutrition messages. And you need to keep those completely separate. Because if I was dealing with a sports person, I'd be giving a completely different thing. I'd be making sure they topped up before they came, topped up during it, topped up after it. And one of the problems we have is in children's sport, where a lot of this has started to happen for kids in PE lessons. They're giving them sports drinks. They don't work hard enough. No, they're not burning. We store about 1,500 calories worth of carbohydrate in a day. So you take an hour's activity in the gym. How many calories do you think an hour's activity in a class or a gym on a normal person burns? Yeah, 250 to 300. 500 if you're lucky and you were being really generous and you worked really hard. They're nowhere near depletion. You know, so there's no need for a carb drink before, during and after. But if I've got a high intensity muscular person doing a high intensity workout for an hour, hour and a half, then they're likely to have, have depleted it right down. So massively different in terms of how you deal with somebody. And even when I get a sports person in, I have to do so much investigation before I write their diets because I have to match it. The two have to equal. Everybody's different and... Uh, and and so on and, and so forth but it you, you know it does get down to that now i want you to do a sum for me now i'm going to give you a calculator each if you don't have one if i can just pass these around and if you're listening to this at home get your calculator out Right, you eat 100 calories a day more than your body needs and outputs in its metabolism, 100 calories. Now, just to give you a feel for 100 calories, it's one finger of Twix. Now, you because I deliberately mentioned Twix because you go, oh, I shouldn't be eating Twix. Um, it's one slice of bread or a quarter of a bowl of pasta. So even in healthy food, it's a quarter, it has a calorie value. So 100 calories a day, too much. How many days are in a year? 365, so multiply that by 365 days of the year. Now, take my word for it until we do a little bit more work, but the equivalency in the body of burning off a pound of fat is three and a half thousand calories you've got to get rid of to get a pound of fat off okay so divide your total by three and a half thousand and what do you get One square. 10.4 ish yeah so that's how many pounds of fat you could put on in a year of just eating 100 calories a day more than your body outputs. So 100 times 300 divided by three and a half thousand, which is a pound of fat. That's how many pounds of fat you could put on in a year. 10 pounds. It's a lot. So why realistically does it go on? So I'm going to give you the perfect example because I am the model example of the easiest way to put weight on. Uh, apart from the fact I don't have a thyroid, which is why, um, you, you know, because the thyroid controls the metabolism, so there are issues around that. But let me just take life in general. I used to live in Chester, and um, because I'm a working professional woman, as all your clients will be, I have a cleaner at home, I have a dishwasher, if I buy toilet rolls for the bathroom upstairs, God forbid I do any extra muscle contraction by taking them up the stairs when I go in 
I put them on the bottom stairs until I next go up. And uh, I call it time management. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's time management. Then if I get a night off, I get the remote control, you bring it by the sofa. I get my drink, I bring it by the sofa. God forbid there is a muscle contraction for me to turn the telly over. It's a thumb movement, the smallest muscles in the body. God forbid there's any ATP being burnt. Yeah, makes sense? The only thing that my husband made me do was wash the car by hand. Because in the old days, he said, if you went in one of those machines, it leaves little scratches. But then in um, Chester, they opened the, one of the first kind of American hand car washes. And it was called, which I can't say loud because it's a swear word. In Canada, apparently, it's a term of endearment. But it means using your hand. Uh, <laughs> and it was called... Um, that and it said the underneath the title it said the best hand job in the world and when that came it was like bliss i now don't need to wash the car either so effectively we reduce down dramatically how much output we have on metabolism yet food has gone more energy dense believe it or not the volume of food that people eat has decreased over the last couple of decades but the energy density of foods has gone sky high. So I refer to foods as being high density foods or low density foods. So if you look at the carbohydrate group, you've got high density carbohydrates, bread, rice, pasta, potato, but you've got low density carbohydrates like parsnips and vegetables, and they're all part of the carbohydrate group, but they're low density. They don't bring along much carb to worry about. They're predominantly water. So when you get back to that equation, you look at balance, which is what we've looked at now, and you look at calories. Do we have balance? Do we have the good quality foods? Do they bring nutrients with them? Where are the calories sitting for that person? And it's quite a detailed process of doing that analysis on a one-to-one, -one, for which you can charge a, a great service. Um, you, you know, But it becomes kind of, like I say, one of those light bulb moments and not rocket science. Um, now, I just want to talk about a couple of other things, because we did 100 calories a day for a year, and it's only a small amount of food, but that's not how people live. A lot of people are quite good Monday to Thursday, and then Friday night, we'll order a Chinese in. And the Chinese will put about 2,000 calories extra, so it's more than 100 a day. Calories aren't a daily thing. If you eat them on a Friday night, they will still go into the body. You, you know, they were not excluded just because you didn't have them Monday <coughs> to Thursday. And I'm a northern lass. So take let's take Christmas. Christmas for me starts about end of November. Usually you start prepping for it, don't you? And, and I have to put the Christmas tree up first week of December. And under the Christmas tree, you've got to have a jar of quality street, little jelly and orange sweets, bowl of nuts out. I start making mince pies. You get out all the drink. What if visitors come? You know, it's Christmas. You've got to make them welcome celebrate so we start eating lots more calories from about beginning of december yeah people give you gifts this place is like a blooming chocolate factory clients bring in gifts and chocolate and they do it all the time the lads just get piles and piles and piles of chocolate and no matter how much we say we're not going to do it it sits there and looks at you and it goes jim i'm delicious i'm chocolate and Jill, who loves chocolate, goes, oh, that poor chocolate just needs to be eaten. That's all it needs. So, so you eat more. On Christmas Day and Boxing Day alone, on those two days in the UK, the average UK person eats six and a half thousand calories extra on Christmas Day and Boxing Day. And if you're northern, that started at the beginning of December. So you can put two pounds of fat on just Christmas Day and Boxing Day. And of course, what do you do? You stay at home, you put the movies on, you lie on the sofa, you do all of that stuff, you, you, you know. And then you eat, you know, the starving children in Africa. So if you were given chocolate and, and all that food over Christmas, you can't waste it, you have to finish it. No, take it to the local hospice, give it away, get it out of the house, because you carry on eating it till mid-January. Then, of course, everybody rushes back to you as fitness instructors, and they will be rushing back with £10 extra on. 
Hard equation. Hard equation, isn't it? Holidays are the same, aren't they? Actually, I'm one of the few people, or, or, well, no, not one of the few people, but a lot of my friends, I lose weight when I go on holiday because I've got time to exercise, I'm on the go all the time, you eat healthier foods because we eat Mediterranean-type foods, you know, everything changes and, and you can lose a bit, a bit of weight. But some people go on holiday and do absolutely the opposite, don't they? They drink loads, they eat loads, they do less, and then they come back with weight on. All those sorts of equations. Now, I just want to reverse the equation for you a little bit, because as fitness instructors doing your case studies, quite often I'm asked, what's a realistic goal in terms of fat loss over a, a period? So if a, a, to lose a pound of fat, you have to cause a deficit of 500, uh, 3,500 calories. So that's a minimum deficit of 500 calories a day. So... That is seven workouts to lose a pound of fat consistently at 500 calories a day. So seven to 10 workouts if you did it just by, you must do it by food and exercise. You can't do it by both. And you must do it by changing your daily output. So you must get up and move around and sit on the edge of your chair. If you do it just by exercise and don't advocate changing lifestyle, to add more movement to it, you are effectively using exercise as you use a low calorie diet. You're using it for the purpose of losing weight and no other reason. When actually we should be creating active lifestyles throughout. And you're gonna love my line, I'm gonna do it again. I did it before. The government could solve this anytime they want to. Absolutely. All lifts should be locked up unless you already have a disability and need to request the key. Perfect. No school should have vending machines on any of its floors that have got chocolate and stuff in it. School dinners should be regulated. The first thing that happened to school dinners was when Jamie stamped up and down. That was the first time they were ever looked at. Supermarkets should be banned from putting sweets and chocolates and things at the front where kids want to pick them up. Only, only voluntarily, but I think we should just make it law. I think we should just make it law, and that's it. Also, any snack foods outside of normal foods should have the health warning on it that cigarettes were forced to put on. Eating this can damage your health. And it's simple. We, we fought for years and had it on cigarettes. I think we should just make it law. So... When I'm Minister for Health, <laughs> I'm going to make those laws and I'm going to bring them in. Car parks should all only have disabled spots for their first three rows next to a building. How frustrating. Even I, Mo, you go to the, the uh, parking thing in town and I'll go, they don't need that many. There's only ever one car there. And so you have to park five rows back. God forbid you have to walk into the gym. <laughs> you, you know, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, 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 they would. They'd drive right up to the door, wouldn't they? So, and then get out and do the exercise. So, for me, your recommendations need to include a deficit in calories created by food. They need to include quality recommendations about food. They need to include exercise recommendations, but they absolutely need to include movement recommendations throughout a normal everyday activity so that calories are not controlled just by diet and exercise. Let's say sitting on the edge of the chair, standing up for half an hour, moving. People who fidget a lot will be uh, much more calorie dense. Now, this is a picture of the eat well plate. This is a very important plate if you're given the choice of four to describe it. You can see here that these are equal thirds of the plates between the fruit and veg section and the bread and cereal section. So it's about a third of the plate and a third of the plate. Then you can see the final third is split up into meat, poultry and fish in your protein group, your dairy group and your fats and oils being the smallest proportion of the plate. This is what the health service work all their information on. It's 
called the eat well plate. I prefer to use a pyramid and I'm going to show you a few. Pyramids are great. I also have blank pyramids that we laminate, which would be really good for some of your nutrition group work, is make some blank ones and, and get people to stick things in them or get them to put them on the fridge and tick them with a pen and uh, so on and so forth. So this is an Atkins one, uh, which I just thought I'd show you for fun. So this is protein based and you can see it's it's got hardly any uh, calories of, of sugar or carbohydrates in it. Now. This is the healthy eating pyramid. Now, the healthy eating pyramid came out probably about seven or eight years ago from the Harvard Disease Centre in America. And it's also come out of the London Disease Centre, but our health service is not yet using it. I've got a question why. I don't know why, but they still use the eat well plate. Uh, now, the eat well plate doesn't highlight the problem because it still has this massive carbohydrate group sitting there. Look at the healthy eating pyramid, and I prefer people to use that. For your assessments, of course, guys, you have to refer to the eat well plate. But in real life, let's get a grip and use the healthy eating pyramid. What I love about the base of this pyramid is that the, it's daily exercise and weight control. You can then see what would have been the carbohydrate group on the eat well plate as being the next biggest. It doesn't say carbohydrates. It says whole grain foods, whole grain. Yes. Yeah, so that is grainy, husky type carbohydrates, not white refined. If it's white, it's deadly. And I am going to give you an acronym now which for the carbohydrate group, we will use a lot. And it is the word shit, S-H-I-T. They are shit foods. Sugar hit causes insulin trauma. So it's a technical word in nutrition. Sugar hit causes insulin trauma absolutely true so we can refer to things as being a shit food s-h-i-t so i did that not as a swear word so you can see here at the bottom of the pyramid that the whole grain foods at most meals avoid any shit and you can see that the shit has been put to the top and it's not even given a whole portion. It's been given a very minor space at the top. So it's completely upended the eat well plate. Because in effect, it's not about eating carbohydrates. It's about eating whole grain food. And this has been around quite a few years now. They also have a plate version of it. So there is a plate version of this. Uh, and I can give you that, but you can look it up yourself on the Harvard uh, site. You can see that the other half of the bottom is plant oils, including canola, soya, corn, sunflower, peanut, and other vegetable oils. So they're encouraging fat. So fat has, has gone to the bigger part, where it's the smallest part on the eat well plate. It's gone to a bigger part, but it's the right type of fat for the body to metabolize. Vegetables in abundance. So, guys, you cannot overeat on vegetables. You would have to be carrying buckets around with you all day to overeat on vegetables. Now, when people, again, look at the Eat Well plate, fruit and vegetables are always put together. And they always say between five and nine portions. So I know people who go, well, I've had loads of fruit today. I've had three bananas, two apples. Fruit should be no more than two portions a day and three on a maybe a sports person <coughs> because it's not five to nine fruit and veg it's only two fruit in amongst that and it should not be sugar face based fruit it should be fiber based fruit like berries and orange and apple and things where you eat the skin pear those sorts of things now you can see that nuts and legumes one to three times a day 
have been given their own spot. So uh, nuts are absolutely vital, obviously, unless you're allergic to them and then you mustn't go near them. Uh, but they're ab and probably the best time to have them is a handful of them in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, because nuts bring along with them good oils, protein and carbs. So they're all three food groups in one. Because of that, they keep a hormone at bay called ghrelin, spelt G-R-E-H-L-N, I think, ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone. So if you have nuts in the middle of the afternoon, it suppresses ghrelin. So it suppresses hunger a little bit. So for an afternoon snack, that's what they're better with. Mm. Yeah, well then you have to portion them before you go to work. Buy a big bag at home and put them in the little snack bags. You know the little snack bags, but you have to learn discipline. That's the whole problem with eating, you have to learn discipline. Yeah. Just a handful. See, that's wrong. But that's overeating, no matter what, isn't it? You know, that's like alcohol abuse and everything else, isn't it? You know, it's just, it's all, yeah, it's everything in modern So, but you can buy in um, Sainsbury's, you buy snack bags and they're about that big. Yeah, but there's nothing. It does. Not for a hungry athlete. Remember not to mix up the messages. Not a hungry athlete, but they would do enough for Mary. For your hungry athlete, then they need about four snacks, but different ball game. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. The messages are very different. I wouldn't be given my Iron Man triathlete a little bag of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would be eating a huge amount more than that. But but it is that. But for weight management, this is this is the key. Then you can see you've got dairy or calcium. And then you've got red meat at the top and butter and white rice at the top. Now, I like this. You can also see it's got uh, alcohol in moderation. Now, the units of alcohol are one to three a day for a woman and one to four a day for a man. Or part a day? No. Yeah. Units. <laughs> Uh, now that's where you also get a problem because a unit is a hundred mil of wine or a hundred mil of beer not so a pint would be about three units yeah i think it's 200 mil of actually of, of beer and a hundred mil of wine and a shot so now i haven't seen a hundred mil wine glass since i was about 17 18 years old in a pub most of them are 175, so they're two and a bit units. That's a small one in a pub now is 175. They're two and a bit units. You ask for a large one in a pub, they're 275. So that's nearly three units of alcohol for a glass. So two or three glasses at night, you need to know what glass they're talking about because it could be way, way over. So we will have a look at it. So, but so I do like this pyramid, and I think it's a better way of of of, of showing people what they should and should not eat. Any thoughts on that? What is, what is your view of that pyramid? It's better, isn't it? Better than the eat well plate. <coughs> so, a mixed message again for you guys: you have to use the eat well plate for your assessment and the pyramid for your real life. Here's another pyramid. This is the UK version of the same pyramid. So you can see it describes servings a little bit more, but this is the UK version of it. So this came out of the disease centre in the UK. But they have got the pyramid and they have been using it for some time, but it's not filtered its way down to lo locality yet. Okay, last couple of things before we finish for a break I want to look at are vitamins and minerals. Would anybody like a wee break before? Yes, please. Thank you.